Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this um, hour of worship. We will have a call to worship on the uh, screen to read responsibly here in a moment. Uh, please stand and join me in uh, reading that. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now please join us as we sing together our songs of praise. Come, now is the time to worship.
bit of a preparation, or it is a preparation for the message. If you had a chance to look in the bulletins, it's prayer. And um, one of my favorite parables Jesus tells about that persistent widow. So I'm looking forward to what you're going to talk on, um, Virgil. So the next song, I Need Thee Every Hour. for the Building Maintenance Fund. Uh, I think it's appropriate to share a bit of an update on the parking lot. A couple of months ago, the last time we took this offering, uh, we shared about um, a plan for this summer. It's, anyway, the particulars it didn't matter, but the Building Grounds Committee after that continued to discuss and get some more bids and uh, ended up recommending the council, which was approved. If I got this right, this summer we're going to clean the parking lot then we're going to reseal the cracks and then uh, repaint the lines. And then for the longer term, since in the relatively near future, we anticipate some sort of new surface, uh, probably quite a bit of asphalt, which would be quite expensive. Uh, the deacons have been asked to think of what are, how, to, how to best save for that big coming expense. So we're discussing that and hope you want that. So that's an update. So, thank, thank you, you Building Grounds, for all you have. Uh, let, let's pray the. Let's pray before the offering, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this facility that we're able to gather in today. Uh, we thank you for those who care for the facility. We ask that you would provide them with wisdom and energy. We ask too that you will use this building and the activities that take place here to bring people to know you better. These things we ask in Jesus' name.
Thank, Thank you, Henrietta. Henrietta. We are going to do a responsive reading on the Catechism on Prayer, Lord's Day 45. I'll read the questions and please join me in the answer. Why do Christians need to pray? Because prayer is the most important part of the thankfulness God requires of us. And also because God gives his grace and Holy Spirit only to those who pray continually and groan inwardly, asking God for these gifts and thanking him for them. How does God want us to pray so that he will listen to us? First, we must pray from the heart to know other than the one true God who has revealed himself in his word, asking for everything he has commanded us to ask for. Second, we must acknowledge our need and misery, hiding nothing, and humble ourselves in his majestic presence. Third, we must rest on this unshakable foundation even though we do not deserve it, God will surely listen to our prayer because of Christ our Lord. This is what he promised in his word. What did God command us to pray? Everything we need, spiritually and physically, as embraced in the prayer Christ our Lord taught us. What is this prayer? Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our debts, and we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, there is no one like you. Creator of the universe, you stand outside of all that you have made and somehow beyond our imagination, hold a universe so expansive, so beyond our grasp in the palm of your hands. Lord, help us to recognize your greatness and give you all praise and all glory. And our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of your dear Son to walk this earth, to live a life of righteousness that we could not live, and to die a death to pay for sins that we cannot pay for, so that we could have life and be restored to fellowship with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Be praised forever by us. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We ask for an outpouring in our day. It seems like we need it almost like no other time in the world. But Lord, they needed it in the early church too when they were so small and so struggling and were persecuted so much. And Lord, you heard their prayers and you expanded the kingdom and people went out from Jerusalem and Judea to the uttermost parts of the then known earth. And Lord, the gospel kept spreading by imperfect people, by sinners who know of the wonder of your forgiveness. And Lord, may that be us. So we pray, O oh God, that you will be merciful to your church. Be merciful to Zilla Faith Church here, and thank you for their witness to the community and for the lives that they touch and for every church that upholds the name of God. We pray, Lord, that you will bless the Christian Reformed Church through its ups and downs as we finish the Synod and it seems in many ways pretty united, but uh, like, like the um, world in which we live, there's a lot of division, a lot of opinions, a lot of sorrow, a lot of brokenness, a lot of anger, a lot of hatred. We pray, Lord, that we as Christians may not be the ones who manifest that. We pray that your Holy Spirit will work in us in such a way that no matter who the sinner is, no matter what the sin, that we are all saved by one Savior who has to forgive all of our sins, whether we're in the church or outside of the church, that we find hope in you. And Lord, uh, protect our Supreme Court justices as they made decisions that are unpopular to many and popular to others. And we pray, Lord, that you will lead them all, Congress, our leaders, in the way of righteousness, in a way that is pleasing to you, that they may even make decisions, Lord, that uh, they may not agree with, but uh, um, honor the people that they serve, but most of all, honor the God who gave us life. 
And Lord, we thank you for the gift of everything. Thank you for the gift of our next heartbeat and the air that we breathe. And Lord, we would not exist if it was not for you, and we would not live beyond this second if you did not permit us. So thank you for being such a gracious, compassionate Father. Be it those who hurt, Lord, who suffer from various diseases or struggles or from getting old or other things, we pray for your mercy in their lives and that you will hear their prayers as you promise in Scripture that you hear and you answer and you are our hope. <clears throat> Lord, for those who struggle with emotional or mental disorders, depression, or some things far more severe than that, we pray for your divine mercy and intervention. As um, we know people whose uh, minds are are really messed up because of drugs or other things. And we pray, oh God, that you will hear their prayers when they cry out to you and many ask for complete healing and wonder how come that hasn't come. But Lord, we know that our complete healing will only come when Jesus comes again. And so let us be ready. Lord, guide us as your believers. Help our lights to shine for Jesus Christ in a world that does seem so full of darkness. And Lord, may uh, the things we say and the things we do give honor to you. Let our light so shine before men and women around us that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. Thank you for calling us to be a generous people, Lord, and let our generosity shine as well because we love you so much. So receive us, Lord, into your fold and help us to advance your kingdom. Speak to us by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, teach us to pray. Thank you for the beautiful Lord's Prayer. And Lord, help us to follow that pattern all our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we'll have the scripture reading, Luke 18. Thanks be to God. Dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, um, the story of the relentless widow that Jesus tells us to remind us to always pray and not give up reminds me of the guy who exclaimed, Can you believe it? My neighbor knocked at my door at 2.30 in the morning. Luckily for me, I was still up playing my bagpipes. <laughs> the widow in Jesus' story pestered a judge like a neighbor playing their bagpipes at 2.30 in the morning. So we're going to look at a couple of points here, starting out at the beginning with the master's instruction. What does Jesus expect of us? What is his requirement that he's asking here in this first verse? And so Luke makes it very plain. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. That is the key to this whole parable. Matthew Henry said, Luke left the key hanging on the door when it comes to the parable's clear purpose. Always pray and never give up. Always pray and don't faint. The King James says, always pray and don't lose heart is another translation. Always pray and never give up. Now, if you had read this parable, 
Would you have gotten that message from that first verse as a single focus that you were supposed to read on as you went through the whole parable? That it's always to pray, that we're always to pray and not give up. And that's why Luke wrote this. We might hear the importance of prayer in desperate times, certainly, but would we hear that we should always pray, even in good times, even when we are so blessed? We should always pray and not give up. How often is always? Well, that's an easy question, isn't it? Um, John 8, 29, Jesus said, I always do what pleases my Father. Well, I can't say that. I'd like to say that, but I always do what pleases my Father. That's why Jesus never failed where we fail from time to time and maybe more often than we like to admit. But Jesus always did that. In Philippians 4, we're told to rejoice in the Lord always. Now, Paul wrote that from prison, and he seemed to have a way of doing that. But there are times when I'm not very thankful, and there are times when I'm not rejoicing the Lord and ask, Lord, what are you doing? What's going on in this world? Things are so crazy. But the command is to rejoice in the Lord always. Always find joy and peace in the Lord. Hebrews 7.25 speaks of Jesus also after his resurrection. When it says that, Therefore, Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. You ever think of Jesus as always living to intercede for you personally as a believer? Now, we can't do that for the whole world in the same way that Jesus could intercede for millions, maybe billions of people. But nonetheless, to think of him, you think his job was already done on the cross. He died. He resurrected. He ascended to the right hand of God. He reigns. But he always intercedes for us. The widow sets the example by daily coming to the judge. And I think that's a good impression of always. Always doesn't mean that you're in prayer so much that you are completely distracted in life, you can't focus on your job, that your eyes are closed while you're driving down the road. No, always, daily is a good example of always, right? This widow goes daily before a ruthless judge. So we have the master's instruction to always pray, and then the story Jesus tells, he presents a ruthless judge. Now the Romans appointed judges from the Sanhedrin Pharisees, the religious leaders, to judge some of the legal and religious affairs of the Jewish world. But they also, and in fact, that's why you can figure how they were able to set up a court late in the night, which was against their own law, and try Jesus and convict him and condemn him to death because they controlled the court when it came to religious matters. But the Romans also had Gentile judges who were not Jews, and they uh, ruled over everything else and also matters of justice. But Barclay said that the Jews called these judges, they had a, a, a Hebrew term for them, Diane Gazaloth, which meant robber judges. That was a Jewish term for the Gentile judges if they went before them, robber judges. Judges who always expected a bribe. They wanted to be paid off. If you wanted to justice, you were going to pay for it. This Roman judge here did not fear God or care about people. And, you know, we could easily get off on the topic of unjust, unjust, judges, unjust judges, such as the Supreme Court of 1857 in that infamous, notorious Dred Scott decision where seven Supreme Court justices out of nine shamefully agreed that our United States Constitution was not written to include black people as citizens. So judges can make mistakes, even the best of them. But we'd miss Jesus' message, wouldn't we, on prayer? Always pray and never give up. So Jesus tells about this powerful judge confronted daily by a relentless widow who seems to have no power at all, as he certainly doesn't have money to pay him off. Now, widows were common in antiquity. A Jewish girl married as young as 13 or 14 years old. 
you're, you're probably, probably trying to keep your daughter from, from that age in marriage, right? But 13 or 14 years old, you know, a boy's bar mitzvah was at age 12. They didn't have the teenagers like we think of them. The average lifespan was 30 to 35 years. And widows, I mean, women usually outlive men. So it wasn't unusual for a widow or a woman mother to be a widow already in her 20s or early 30s. And you think of Jesus' own mother, Mary, was probably a widow, relatively young. Now, again, you could go off track on this and, and know how much God wants us to care for widows. In fact, it's a great sin if we don't do that. But in James 1, 27, James says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. To look after orphans and widows. These are very needy people. But, again, we would miss Jesus' main point. Always pray and do not give up. Undaunted by the judge's icy heart and constant dismissals, this poor widow comes back every day blowing her bagpipes before the judge who has power to bring justice in her life. Her tenacity is an example of continual prayer, of constant prayer. She comes every day with a can-do faith that she must get up in the morning and say, Lord, is today the day I'm going to get justice? And the judge keeps saying no and keeps sending her away. But the next day, she gets up. And she says again, Lord, is today the day? And she takes her place in line to beg again. And every day that judge looks up and there she is, standing in line again, patiently waiting her turn, wasting his time. She would make it to the front. She would make a request, please, please, Your Honor, Grant me justice. And the ruthless judge would say, Forget it, woman. Get out of here. I don't want to see your face again. She was back in line the next day. And finally, you notice when Jesus tells the story here that the judge cracks. For some time in verse 4, he refused. But finally, he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out by her coming. The, the English word translated wear me out, or I mean the Greek word translated wear me out, is actually a word for boxing. And it means to beat up on another person. It means um, to bruise, to beat a person black and blue, to wear down, to be intolerably annoying. This is emotional pugilism that this widow is inflicting upon this judge who has all the power. And so what he's saying is, she's giving me a black eye. i got to get rid of her. And so he gives her justice. So this widow's desperate tenacity is, is like Jacob when he is wrestling with the angel and says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And so she takes this unjust judge, or merciless judge, and pounds him in the face and says, I'm not going to quit hitting you until you bless me. Now Luke 11, verse 15, actually has a very similar kind of parable. Luke 11, verse 5 through 13, I'm sorry. Luke 11, 5, Jesus says there, suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight Pounds on his door, blows his bagpipes, and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. The one inside answers, Don't bother me. Quit banging on my door. Don't play your bagpipes at this time of the night. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though you will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet... Finally, yet, because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs to get him away from his family. So I say to you, and this application of Jesus in this parable would fit 
the parable of the persistent widow. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Always pray with undying hope in God. Now, it doesn't mean that Christians never get discouraged. If you go to Psalm 73, most of the psalm is a discouragement from a person who loves the Lord. It says, Lord, why do the wicked prop prosper so? Why are their children healthy? Why don't they ever seem to have anything that goes wrong? And it looks like he's going to pretty deep despair because he follows the Lord, loves the Lord, but things must not be going quite as good for him. And, and you know, don't you kind of wish God would make a better divide of things like he did when the Israelites were slaves and he punished Pharaoh with the ten plagues? You know, he, he put light on Israel and darkness on them and hail fell on them but didn't fall on them and those kind of things. If God would make it that clear, more people would become Christians just to save their lives, Right? But the psalmist finally comes back to his senses a bit, and he says, Yet, yeah, Lord, I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. Now, I know that's poetry, but I think he was serious. But that's not one that I would necessarily say. Earth has nothing I desire. Well, there's a lot of things I desire. I want to be comfortable. I don't want sickness. I don't want cancer. I want to die quick when it happens. You know, there's a lot of things I desire. I, I want to all my children and grandchildren and loved ones to know Jesus. You know, I want the church to grow and prosper in grace and not have any division. But whom have I in heaven? He's, he's right at the heart of the matter, isn't he? Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I love Peter's response when Jesus taught in John 16, and he told people, you know, that unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you will have no part of me. And people didn't get it, and we probably wouldn't have got it either. And so some of them thought that he was talking about some kind of cannibalism, and in fact, the early Christian church was accused of that at times because of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So lots of people left Jesus after that message in John 6. In fact, so many that Jesus turned to his disciples and said, will you go too? And Peter said, Lord, to whom can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? There's no other choice. There is no other God. You alone have the words of eternal life. And so Jesus concludes this parable in Luke 18. Let's see, that's in the New Testament, isn't it? Okay. Luke 18, verse 6. The Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Now, we've had the unjust judge and the relentless widow, and we have his response being forced his hand being forced. But now, hear about God. And will not God, who loves you as his children, if you believe in him, bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on you? But the parable turns now. You're going to a God who does bring justice. For his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night. This is the God to whom Abraham pleaded for Sodom and Gomorrah for mercy and said, Lord, if you just find even ten righteous people, he said, will not the judge of all the earth do right? And the obvious answer is yes, the Lord will do what is right. 
In Revelation 6, verse 9, though, and, it, you know, Jesus says that he will do it quickly. Will he put, keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. But you have indications in the Bible that to humans, it hasn't happened quickly. In Revelation 6, when the fifth seal is open, in verse 9, John saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? And each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer. Wait a little longer until the number of the fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. Wait a little longer. Will he keep putting his children off? Jesus said, no. He will act quickly. I, will, I, I tell you, Jesus says emphatically, like a truly, truly, I say to you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. And quickly has to mean something different to Jesus than does to us. Other translations say speedily, swiftly. Well, it's 2,000 years now since Jesus told that parable. 2,000 years is not quickly by any human standard. Christians, we, we can't be blind to the fact that Jesus did not come back as soon as believers expected him in every generation. You see Paul and the apostles writing about Jesus' soon return, and you see people expecting it in every generation in World War II, you know, people sure were sure Hitler was the Antichrist and they knew Jesus was going to come back. He didn't. So we keep on waiting. And in fact, Peter gives us a little insight to this because this is not human time when he says in 2 Peter 3, do not forget this one thing, dear friends or dear children, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. So 2,000 years to God is like two days. I don't get that, but I can understand how it's that way for the Lord. But for us, this is a long time. It doesn't feel quickly. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So we kind of, kind of get on God's time clock. God will answer the prayers of his children according to his will and in his time. Think about the Israelites when they became slaves in Egypt. They immediately, I'm sure, blew their bagpipes, said, Lord, deliver us. Please, Yahweh, come, deliver us. You are our Savior, Father, God the Father of Abraham, please deliver us. How long did they pray that prayer? How long were they begging for God to come? Maybe some of them just decided to follow the Egyptian gods, the sun gods, and all that. They prayed that for almost 400 years, 10 generations. In Genesis 15, hopefully they knew this verse as promised Abraham. The Lord says, I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. <laughs> And afterwards, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. Um, let's see, where's the 400 years? Did I miss that? Genesis 15, verse 13, old verse 34. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. That's a long time to always pray and not give up. God will answer the prayers of his children according to his will. And in his time, the Israelites blew their bagpipes and they cried out to God. And people keep crying out to God. But God does answer prayer. For centuries and now millennium, believers keep looking for Jesus' soon return. When Jesus comes, it's going to shock everyone. Like, I don't know if you've been at a stoplight in a car and been rear-ended, totally unexpected. Jesus' return will be something like that. 
bam, he's here that quick. In the meantime, Jesus asked that great question. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? That question implies tough times, doesn't it? That people are going to leave the Lord, that they won't endure to the end. And Jesus said in his uh, sermon on the last days that you're going to have children turn against their parents and all kinds of evil things that you can't imagine are going to happen. Well, some of that stuff maybe is already happening and there's worse things to come maybe. But the worst things have come throughout history too. In Hebrews chapter 10, and this was written already way back then, the writer of Hebrews says to the church, beginning in verse 32, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Now ask whom have I in heaven but thee, and nothing on earth matters besides thee, right? So do not throw away your confidence, it will richly be rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. How are you when it comes to uh, living by faith? Does your faith grow day by day or does it fade and waver at times? Are you tempted to be like the skeptics? You know, things haven't changed for 2,000 years. Why is he going to return now? Maybe the liberal theologians are right. Maybe it's all spiritual. And the Son of Man returns. Will he find faith on the earth? That question tells us that the Son of Man will be looking for those who are looking for him. The Son of Man will be looking for those who are looking for him. Are you looking for him? Will you be able to say, will I be able to say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race? Spurgeon says, you know, it's strange that we make such little use of God. Though he is our God, we scarcely give ourselves to him and ask so little of him. How often do we go about our daily lives without seeking his guidance? How often do we carry our burdens and wrestle with him instead of casting all of our cares upon him? If Virgin was asking me that personally, I'd probably say way too often. Since we have such a friend who invites us to come to him, draw your strength from him daily. That's all he's praying. Don't be waiting when you have such a God. Go to your treasure. Run to him. Tell him all your needs. Use him constantly. If life is, is full of darkness and shadows, let the sun shine down on you. If you have lost your way in the maze of life, cling to God. Whatever you are, wherever you are, God is what you need and want. So we read in the Catechism, pray continually and groan inwardly. Jesus warned his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane when they fell asleep while he told them to pray, wake up, be in prayer so you will not yield to temptation. Psalm 37, 4 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Again, Jesus asked, when the Son of Man returns, will you find faith on the earth? I've been doing a study with a, a couple of people uh, of young woman committed her life to Christ and then someone said, go talk to Pastor Virgil because she had some huge issues to deal with and so we started, uh, you know, she was reading her Bible a lot and getting really confused and so we started talking about that and she said, you know, my dad would like to meet you. He's, he's older than I am. I'm going to be 70 next month. Anyway, um, I said, okay. So we got together at a coffee shop and, and um, and I asked him what he knew about God, and he's not much. He said, I've been to a Catholic church when I was really young, and I kind of liked it, but I, I don't know much about God. And I said, well, would you like to do a study with us? And he said, yeah, but he said, I don't want to read the Bible. That's too heavy for me. So we picked the book, Mirror Christianity. 
And we've, we've been, been meeting now for about two months at Sherry's or Coffee Shop every Tuesday. And as we're going through it chapter by chapter, we came to the end of book two in there, in which C.S. Lewis writes this little phrase, when the, when the author walks onto the stage, the play is over. Now, I read that because I read the chapter, but it didn't stick in my mind. And so I said, do you have any other comments in this chapter? He said, uh, I read that, and he said, that scared me. When the author walks on the stage, the play is over. And so I said, well, what do you want to do about that? Are you ready to commit your life to Christ? And he said, yeah, I think I would like to do that. Now, I seldom have anybody that that's open. Obviously, the Holy Spirit was doing a work there. And so, so he did. We prayed together, and uh, we're still meeting and finishing the book, Mere Christianity, which is a wonderful book to go through with non-Christian, but even as a Christian, you know. That's the one that has the Lord, liar, lunatic argument, and so many wonderful insights from C.S. Lewis. By the way, this is the 80th anniversary of that book or those lectures that he gave during World War II that the British asked him to give because um, they were being bombed continually by Hitler and the Germans, and so uh, they were trying to inspire the people, give them some hope, and have them think about the Lord. Again, though, what do we learn from Jesus' parable? Always pray and never give up. Why? Because prayer works. Prayer works. Now, like any good relationship, prayer is work. And I don't know how your prayer life is, but it's one that I struggle with. I work at and I try to talk to the Lord a lot, but boy, I could sure do a lot better. But like any good relationship, you work at it. There's sweat and there's sorrow on the journey, but there's also reward and blessing. We're compelled by Christ's love for us and our love for him. Prayer does work. James says the faithful prayer of a righteous person avails much. Prayer is a humble acknowledgement that you, like a poor widow, like this poor widow, need God. Augustine said prayer and helplessness go hand in hand. That may be a problem in American society with the self-made man or woman, right, or the pioneer spirit, but there's got to be a time when you know you can't do everything, when you know that you're dependent on someone far greater than you. Prayer and helplessness go hand in hand. So brothers and sisters, keep blowing your bagpipes at 2.30 in the morning. May you be a huge yes to Jesus' question, when I return, will I find faith on your May your faith be so strong that when Jesus comes back, he looks at you with a huge, well done smile as you shout, I knew you'd come, Lord. I knew you'd come just as you promised. Thank you, Jesus. I knew you'd come. Amen. Lord Jesus, we await your return. And there's an insert in the bulletin of the prayer of John Calvin written over 500 years ago upon rising from sleep. And he prayed, My God, Father and Savior, since you have been pleased to give me the grace to come through the night to the present day, now grant that I may employ it entirely in your service, so that all my works may be to the glory of your name and the edification of my neighbors. As you have been pleased to make your sun shine upon the earth to give us bodily light, grant the light of your spirit to illumine my understanding and my heart. And because it means nothing to begin well if one does not persevere, I ask that you would continue to increase your grace in me until you have left me into full, led me into full communion with your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is the true Son of our souls, shining day and night, eternally and without end. Hear us, merciful Father, by our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And you do have that insert in your bulletin of a prayer upon rising from sleep, a prayer by John Calvin, and then a beautiful hymn prayer called Holy Spirit, Life Divine, and some other biblical prayers listed. I invite you to uh, pray that daily this week. Now we're going to uh, sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus. We do wait for Jesus' return, and until then we pray. 
Would, Would you stand, stand with us and sing this song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus? What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. Receive now the Lord's parting blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen.